All right, guys, welcome back to the Sagey Bard podcast, where we discuss business. <laughs> yeah. All right, guys, we're, we're down to business. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about the business mind. We're also going to talk about the UAW strike and uh, Toyota's response. And then uh, we're going to talk about Tesla, uh, some stuff happening with Tesla, the Cybertruck, and um, so our last topic with Tesla. Oh, uh, institutional investors um, and um, so, uh, doing ads on behalf of Tesla. So uh, let's move into our first uh, topic, the business mind. We were having a, Sage and I were having a discussion about the business mind, and we thought that it would be helpful to our viewers if yeah. they could, you know, kind of listen in um, to see what you know we've done and where our where our mindset has been and what others have done, and just to kind of you know, if you guys are interested in business, uh, if you're interested in creating any sort of products, uh, this you may find this helpful. So. Uh, maybe Seiji, you could talk. We could talk a little bit about. Um, okay, why? Why? Why does um, first of all the business mind? Yeah. Why? Why? If I could kind of pick your brain for the camera, why? Um, why did you? Why do you? Why are you interested in business? Let me set our time, our stopwatch up well, here. Well, for me, um, the reason I love business mm -hmm. is the same reason I love sports in high school elementary school, college. I love sports. Okay. And I love sports because there are winners and there are losers. Okay. To be honest. Mm -hmm. And business is something where you get to compete and you get to keep on playing a sport or a game. Okay, so okay, so and for me it's fun to use. It's fun. Okay. I, I like the idea of playing a game and winning. And I know I that know you talked not, about monopoly. Oh, go yeah. ahead, go ahead, and I know that that might run counter to a lot of the things like Christian principles. But I do love the game, the competition aspect yeah. of it. It's not even how I use what I get from the winnings. I just love the game. You love the, the game of competition. Um, that makes sense. So that means you could probably compete in anything. Then it doesn't. Yeah. You're not really concerned with necessarily the product itself. You're just like no. whatever it is. If it makes money, yeah. If it Okay, cool, cool. So you... Um, I like the idea, and, and that's where I have a real problem with the modern, modern education is, well, everyone's a winner, and there's a participation award. Mm -hmm. and that, that, to me, is completely ridiculous. Mm -hmm. There is clearly a definition between what's winning and what is losing. Mm -hmm. And I think it's wrong, it's disingenuous for society to say, well everyone gets a, tar uh, a participation award. Well, yeah. there's some things that you're not good at and you stop doing. For example, mm -hmm. I took nine and a half years of piano and I can find middle C. <laughs> I you took nine and a half years of piano? Nine and a half wow. years of piano, four and a half years of violin, and I know one of the strings is E. I, I don't even know the rest. <laughs> I mean... I took a year and a half of piano. Yeah. I, I, you, okay, cool. I have zero interest in playing musical instruments and uh, I think they produce beautiful sounds. <laughs> but it's not for me. Did your parents make you get into yep. it? All right, not to segue too far away. So, um, so what type of um, just uh, if you if you are open with sharing with our audience, um, yeah. whatever you can share. What do you? What type of business do you like to do now? What do you find yourself doing? What do you enjoy? I have always loved real estate mm -hmm. and finances. Okay. Um, what is it about real estate? that you like and then what it's and then let's real. get into the business it's mind it's tangible that. you can grow on it <laughs> okay it can't disappear like mm, stocks and bonds yeah. or crypto yeah it's tangible crypto has a funny way of disappearing huh it does look you know at, especially look at when Sam you have Bankman Friedman <laughs> yep. when you have um, yeah. criminals like him he's going to jail well I hope he goes to jail for a thousand and ten years rather than a hundred and ten years he's probably gonna get life yeah He's done. Well, I, I think they, they should consider putting his mom and dad in jail, too. For, um, <laughs> for birthing him? No, because they, oh, they, helped they, out? they helped out to a degree. And, and really? Also, I didn't know that. They've also covered for him. They've benefited financially wow. from his crimes. And, I, I mean, there are a lot of politicians who've also benefited from uh, Mr. 
SBFs. Oh, yeah, you're right. A lot of the Dems, Democratic. Well, was he? Did he get any of the Repub Republicans corrupted no, as well? Just he the funded. Dems? He funded a lot of um, of what is it called? Midterm election campaigns. Ooh. And I think him actually not going. That's not a topic for the day. But we're yeah. just gonna we're gonna quickly move. Let's just move away from it now. Yeah. We can talk about it another time. But. Um, but yeah. so the, the business mindset. So what is the business mindset? What do you? Th what is that to you? And how is it different from like a nine to five? Um, nine to well, five thinking. I think nine to five thinking. <clears throat> those are the people who get up and say, "Okay, I I gotta get to work at eight or nine, and then I'm out five to at five or six o'clock." Mm -hmm. And the you can be successful doing that. It's a different type of career than I've obviously chosen. Um, I love business because business is different mm -hmm. than choosing a, care, a, a career in healthcare where you know you get on a train heading from San Bernardino or Redlands mm -hmm. and you're going west. Mm -hmm. You will end up at Union Station in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. Business might take you to Bakersfield and Fresno <laughs> before you go down to San Diego. It's kind yeah. of like a cartoon right. where you go all over before you finally arrive mm -hmm. at um los angeles and the thing i love about it is it's unscripted okay yeah it's unscripted you're winging it and by winging it you don't know how today looks you don't know how today or tomorrow looks it's mm -hmm. just you have to have enough faith in yourself mm -hmm. if you're taking it to the extreme that i can make this work i can connect the dots okay um and sometimes you can't connect the dots every day. It's, it's, business it's, is very... It's dicey. It's dicey. Yeah, that wasn't the word I was going to use, but that's a great word, a great synonym. All right, let's move into... Um, we were talking about immigrant populations. And I'll, let me talk about what I view the business mindset as really quickly. Maybe the audience might be interested in my, my perspective. I like business because it, it's literally the stuff dreams are made of. Mm -hmm. It... It is self-determination on steroids. The possibilities are endless. Anything you can imagine, you can do, especially in America, right? Yep. And it provides the sort of mental freedom, even if you're not, you know, it, it gives you dreams. Um, you, for instance, when you get into, um, let's say, a career, right? Let's say you get into education. Let's say you become a, a teacher. From day one, you know your beginning and end salary for the most part. Yeah. So you know, I will never own this. I will never live here. Your future is set. You understand that, right? Now you have to be fine with that. And a lot of people are they're like, okay, yeah, I'm fine with this. And, and I think everyone, not everyone wants the same things, right? Uh, there are... I know people who are teachers who are happy and they have homes and they're, they're satisfied with life, right? It all depends on how you manage. And then business, when's the last time you saw a teacher being celebrated in terms of, I mean, we do have teachers being celebrated on TV, but when's the last time someone was like following a teacher's life and writing articles about this teacher, how awesome their life is? Not... Not Very often. often. But how often do you see that about Jeff Bezos or Steve Jobs? And how many books do you see? Teachers, is, it's usually about how well they did for their students and how self, selfless they were. And it's a different dynamic, right? Exactly. It, it is. And I, I think that when you <clears throat> look at it, if you're able to start, I remember, for example, when I was, uh, I first started, uh, became a professor when I was 22, mm -hmm. right? 20, maybe even earlier than that, 21. I remember thinking, if I teach for my whole life, mm -hmm. for 50 years until I'm 72, I could impact maybe 20,000 students over a career. But if you're able to do something different in terms of business or mm -hmm. create a new system, right. you could impact maybe 20,000 people per year. Mm -hmm. So when you're looking at it, one of the things that I always fall back on, and you've heard this from me, and I used to talk with one of my best friend Steve who we used to teach together mm -hmm. it's the Gordon Gecko speech from 
Wall Street, 1987. Okay. Yes. And that is, greed is good. Okay. He says, greed is good. Greed marks the upward tick of mankind. Mm -hmm. Greed cuts through the fat. Greed, for lack of a better word, is good. And I can understand people have a lot of problems with the word greed. And I do too. Mm -hmm. But greed is in its other more softer forms, allows you to look at an organization and say, this is not right. It allows mm -hmm. you to cut away inefficiencies, cut the fat, mm -hmm. and make something better. Like whether it's in ministry, whether it's in education, God made us creative people mm -hmm. who are called by God to be efficient. Mm -hmm. And I think that greed oftentimes makes you more efficient yeah i would i would swap out the term greed with um drive mm -hmm. ambition in terms of but i think greed I think is what a, is the drive it creates the impetus for that drive because and that's the beauty of capitalism i think dreams can drive it too as well yeah i don't i i think greed greed takes on a dark sort of nature it can because it's it in, it implies that you're taking more than you're supposed to in a way or more or or you're taking it in a way that's cuz you can be for instance you can be selfless like a lot of um business people like say Jeff Bezos right which obviously he's turned to the dark side uh, i think uh -huh. <laughs> with we we had we had to talk about him and what he's doing with his own suppliers and his own um vendors and how he's cannibalizing the his industry well they steal ideas they steal ideas so i believe that's where greed comes in right there and i believe and again i'm not talking about that type of greed but i could totally yeah. understand when people have a problem with the term greed the term greed i can yeah. i can understand it because people could say bezos is uh worth, look at how much is he worth 100 plus billion Probably 150 billion dollars, and then there's, and then you're you're cannibalizing your vendors. That would be greed. Well, yeah, it's, yeah. it's stealing someone else's food. Right, and then you're shutting, and then these people are getting shut down. Who, let's say, you know, and these, you know, so that's greed. That that to me, and then and then there's ambition. Then there's people like Steve Jobs, who created a, a product, who, in his words, were no one, people didn't know they needed it until they saw mm -hmm. it. So he created his own lane. Bezos displaced store shop owners, blah, blah, blah. And then he started to charge them rent, basically. Uh, uh, use, if I can use a terminology that um, someone used when describing what he's doing. He's collecting rent off of all these people. And multiple rents. Yeah. So it's like, you know, you get your product on the store. Then you got to pay to advertise. Now you got to fight Amazon itself <laughs> because who's who is actively fighting you using your back office data to now fight you. So you've got, so he's, well, you'll lose and you're going to lose. And many people have, and they're yeah. losing and he, he'll like, you can be doing very well on Amazon one minute and the next minute you're gone. And that's, that's greed. Well, and that's one of the things that affected you with, uh, I know you and I, you and I've talked with Veco bags, basically they wouldn't allow you to adjust your own price to change my price. Yeah. And then they paused my store. Yeah. And then we called to get the store back up and it was up for a little bit and then they took it back down again. Yeah. So it was just ridiculous. I had a professional help me who worked for Amazon. He helped me. I paid him to help me and it just fizzled out. So this is what, so th these are the complaints. This is greed. This are they is selling a bag that's exactly like your, <laughs> I don't know, but <laughs> there are, there are tons of uh, bags like mine online, but I wouldn't doubt it yeah. when you're worth 150 billion, you can compete against pretty much everyone. everyone. Yeah. You can compete in every industry well, if you want. And that's where the greed is not good because the greed is not you're, good. you're just saying, well, I'm just going to crush Everyone, Everyone. right. And the problem with this is, and this is what we will also be talking about in a little bit with uh, the United Auto Workers. Mm -hmm. I mean, in order for society to continue functioning, mm -hmm. people have to have enough money to spend in an economic system. Right. Otherwise, you will have a collapse. Mm -hmm. um, and we've been close at different times. 
2008 to 2012, we were really close. Right. Um, we might be heading there again. Yeah, and um, it's because of greed. Look at what happened with the mortgage lenders. Yeah, and what we're, when we're generally talking about this, within the construct, we also mentioned Thomas Sowell. Right. And migrations. Who is Thomas Sowell for, for our uh, audience, real quick? Thomas, I love Thomas Sowell, by the Thomas way. Thomas Sowell is a, a fellow with the Hoover Institute. He mm -hmm. has been involved as an economic advisor with numerous uh, presidents, all the way going back, I think, to the 1950s. Didn't he have an article, like a, a column? For a little um, bit with uh, some publication, I can't remember, for a while, like a 20 year running column or something. But he anyway. might have. He's probably. Maybe we can he's, look it up real quick. He's one of the most brilliant people that um, our country has produced. Yeah. He definitely. was a Harvard professor for a number of years. Where did he graduate from? I don't know. Okay. I have uh, a feeling it was Harvard. Um, but he's written books like. Um, Black rednecks and white liberals. Uh, I mean, right, which is a really interesting topic. And it's funny because I was listening to, I was actually listening to um, Steve Wilco's show, and there was a, a talk show where he's a police officer, and they had a guy, they had a couple, I don't know where they were from, black couple, but they both sounded like rednecks. Yeah. And a lot of, you know, that's a whole other subject. Maybe we'll visit that. Well, it's fascinating because he, he talks a lot about. Um, how from the south mm -hmm. how black culture is and why black culture is the way it is and what he's saying is this is not really black culture and people adopt it as black culture but it's actually kind of this scotch irish Redneck culture culture yeah yeah that's from you know uh, tennessee and kentucky it's it's yeah. it has nothing to do with black culture right you're not going to find africans from africa talking like that no or behaving it, it comes with a whole subset of behaviors and, and actions anyway let's let's um so you're going to say thomas thomas so, soul we'll get back to that another time that's a really yeah. fascinating but when topic we're looking at thomas soul what thomas soul did in his book migrations is he studied different um ethnic groups he looks at indians he looks at chinese and he looks at how these people are so successful when they're not in their own country. Mm. So this has obviously changed in the 20 plus years or so since the book was written. Mm -hmm. But 20 years ago, there was a bigger gap between what you see in the United States and China and the United States and India. Right. Um, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on your perspective, mm -hmm. that gap has significantly lessened. Okay. In the United States, today we see homeless encampments that are uh, that look very much like India's uh, what's it called homeless people in the 1980s and and today and in India that homeless population is reduced there mm. are more prospects than there ever were in some of these countries whereas in the United States things are looking more and more dire on a day-to-day -day basis um, because we can't differentiate between our problems and problems with other people overseas and we take those on ourselves but that's a, a different problem but he he's looking at why are these populations and why are these groups successful outside. as soon as you take them out of, outside of right. india or china because in the united states two of the most su successful socio-economic groups or identify or indians and chinese right you know it's government it's government. It's but, government, yeah. That's and the, that's the thing. Yeah. When you look at it, you look at um, whether you could, you could look at it in terms of religion in India, you could look at it in terms of economic or uh, government political systems in mm -hmm. India and China. Mm -hmm. um, why are people more successful? Why are those, have those communities been successful traditionally when you take them out of India? And yeah. that comes back down to something that's so simple to understand. Mm -hmm. Hope. Okay. Hope that if I work harder, I'm mm. going to benefit more. That's why Indians went from, that's why they went from India to Fiji. Mm. That's why they ended up in Jamaica and Guyana and all of these other places, South Africa. Hope. It's the same reason that Chinese ended up in San Francisco and all over the place. Do Indians do well in every country they, they go to? Pretty much. So every country they go to is pretty strategic in terms of it's better than what they had back home in terms of government. Well, and the thing is, they didn't know they would do better initially because they were taken there to build railroads, indentured servants. And it, again, the British Empire hasn't had 
slavery since 19, 1832. Right. So, on paper, they did not have slavery. Mm -hmm. But there's really very little difference between an indentured servant mm -hmm. and a slave. And Indians were basically taken to these places as virtual slaves. But they were trapped in that system, yeah. The correct. Money. But they have done very well, which is why Idi Amin in Uganda got rid of them in mm -hmm. uh, 1972. Mm -hmm. And, well, their GDP is still not doing so well. Yeah, right. But the, the point is... <clears throat> so, okay. Like I said before in an, another podcast, there's the Arabic proverb, he who has health has hope, and he who has hope still has everything. Mm. And the idea is when you leave your homeland, you are unfettered from the confines, oftentimes, that locked you into a certain place in your hierarchy. For example, if you're an untouchable, maybe you go to a different part of the world and people have no idea or concept of Hinduism, and you're no longer locked into being an untouchable. Maybe and you're just maybe, viewed as a person. Maybe it's in the person's mind as well, because yeah. when they're home, they, there's a virtual prison, mindset-wise, because they know where they are. But when they leave, they're free. They're unshackled. Yeah. Um, let's move into, uh, for time's sake, let's go. Let's talk about single mothers. There was a um, some research I'd seen on single mothers and how they. Um, they succeed. The business mindset. Well, it, this is it. This is also business, but it's also career-wise. Mm. But um, again, you have responsible and irresponsible single right. mothers. But right. But some single yeah. mothers tend to be very, very. They can be extremely successful because they're focused. Because they're very focused. Yeah. And um, and I think the business mindset. Not to stray too far from our topic. You have to have that sort of focus, just like the immigrant population who comes. Like, I know Koreans who've come here, right? And they, they do very well because there's hope, like you said. Mm -hmm. there, America provides hope. Its upward mobility is unmatched, right? I, I heard in places like New Zealand, you can go to New Zealand, and the locals will literally try to keep you down. Yeah. There, there's a, they, they, there are places you can go where people don't, as an immigrant, where people, locals, don't want to see you succeed, uh, whether it's business. I know for a fact, I had a, um, some buddies who started uh, businesses in Korea. They would complain that the Koreans didn't want to uh, patronize or patronize their, uh, that's the right word? Yeah. They, they didn't want to go to their businesses uh, because they're foreigners. And you don't have that problem in the United States. You don't have that problem here. So it's like, you know, you can, so Amer I think and the country where you are makes a huge difference. Well, I don't want to say you don't, you don't, it's, it's much less of a problem. Right. Because there are some racist people, but, you know, fortunately most of them are dying out every day. Um, and there are fewer to replace them. Right. <laughs> yeah, the, things are getting better. All right, so single mothers, so the mindset with the, the business mindset is hope. I would say yes. the underlying thing is hope. When we look at these cross sections of immigrant populations, single moms who turned out to be some of the best students, uh, even though they have to work 40 hours a week and they're yeah. taking care of kids, that sort of hope for a better life, um, not being satisfied with the whatever the status quo is for their community or for their society. Well, it's, and it's not only single women. Mm -hmm. It's mothers and fathers mm -hmm. I mean, let's talk about the men yeah for a second i've got um i've got some of my friends they've had i mean they've had kids and everything and when they have kids they're single they're they're focused mm -hmm. they're hyper focused on getting back to spend time with their family mm -hmm. because one of my buddies he says well i just want to go back i want to spend time with my my girls okay that's what he wants to do mm -hmm. and that's awesome. I mean, it, is, it keeps him focused from 6 o'clock in the morning when he has to get up to sometimes I'll talk to him at 10 o'clock at night, and he's still focused because he's like, okay, still I got dialed it. in. He's dialed in. He's, he's like, I have to do this because it's going to give me more time later on, uh -huh. delayed gratification, yeah. to spend with my kids. I've talked to a couple other guys who've had the same sentiment. Uh, the, now there's the concept of the extra gas tank. This is what yeah. we're talking about. Um, Sometimes having dependents 
puts this extra motivation in your tank. And when, when it's just you as a guy or you as just a woman, you know, you may not be as motivated, but when you have mouths to feed, look, like, look, look at animals, for example, when predators come around. Like, you could take an animal who, by him, him or herself, uh, when, when they have no, or itself, excuse me, when female or male, when they have no babies, uh, there's a different attitude, a different disposition yeah. towards other animals that are crossing their paths. When they have cubs, oh my goodness, they are extremely, they take on a new nature. And I think this is what we're talking about with uh, men, women who have kids to take care of, yeah. but they're business minded or career oriented when they're, when they're dialed in, when they're focused, it changes who they are fundamentally. So. Well, and the thing is, it also allows you to be creative with certain people, of course, certain personalities. They're going to say, well, I'm going to build a system that's going to allow me to spend more time with my family. Mm -hmm. I might, I, and that allows you to set up businesses. All right, let's do this. Uh, we are going to take a quick break. We will be right back with part two of this discussion, our, our second segment of this discussion on the business mind. Thank you for uh, staying tuned. All right, we are back, and this is uh, we're talking about the business mind, and we're talking, you know, we're 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 looking at sort of a Venn diagram, if you know what I'm talking about from math class, the overlap of Kamala uh, Harris likes Venn diagrams. Who Kamala Harris? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we're talking about the the overlap in the skill set or the mentality between um, people who are career oriented, whether you're working for a company. Because I think there are there is a certain mindset which translates to business because many of these people who work for companies end up starting their own businesses at times, right? And they're able to take those skills and transfer them over. So let's look at um, people like um, Steve Jobs. Now, I haven't read his book. I've read a little bit. What do you know about, do you know anything about Steve Jobs and what drove him? Steve Jobs. Um, I have no idea what drove him. Incredibly creative. He... In 1972, one of the, uh, this, uh, I read this thing a long time ago, it said, 1972, Steve Jobs was basically, I mean, traveling around India and studying Hinduism. 1972, Bill Gates was um, doing something with IBM or, no, not IBM, just in college. Mm -hmm. And in 1972, IBM was producing typewriters. And you can look at where all of those companies that were started, whether it's Microsoft, IBM, or Steve Jobs are, well, Steve Jobs is nowhere today, but where Apple is. Mm -hmm. And it allows you to see that things can change really quickly. You mm -hmm. don't know what the future holds. Right, right. But Steve Jobs was, it's, it's really kind of too bad that um, people like Elon Musk and Steve Jobs weren't more contemporaries of each other because I think that we would have had technology move forward even faster than it, it has because um, they are definitely two of the most creative and brightest that our societies mm. produced. But Steve Jobs, um, incredibly brilliant guy, he came up with the mouse, he invented pretty much personal computers and Pixar and I mean just completely it, brilliant it, it, guy. It's, it's interesting it's like what drives where's you know with him is it would you say it's greed because I okay let, let's look at it like this I don't think so let's look at it like this there there, ha, there has to be a, a carrot right uh -huh. for everyone there there's a what's in it for me no matter what you're doing most employees it's a salary and a schedule right and personal freedom look at what I Steve say, Jobs right? wore look at Elon Musk they don't really dress any differently. I mean, they dress actually more simple than most people do. I mean, Steve Jobs famously wore pretty much the exact same shirt and jeans every day. Like, yeah. he had a whole closet full of the same clothes. He wasn't focused. You know, no, he was focused. He wasn't focused on clothing and yes. that, that kind of stuff. And he was hyper-focused on what he was, doing. what he was doing. And for mm. people like Elon Musk, mm -hmm. or even you look at Bezos, Bezos... Mm -hmm. Famously drove around in like a Honda Accord for, you know, 25 years. Right, right, right. I remember I that. I mean, he's spending some money now. But even with any of these people, compared to what they could be, they're not very showy. For right. them, money is a scorecard. 
Right. It's a competition. And I think with Steve Jobs, more so than maybe the other two, it was a power trip type of thing. Mm -hmm. And maybe it was a power trip thing because he felt somewhat unwanted because he was, uh, I mean, adopted. But, I, I mean, he was very grateful to his adopted family because mm -hmm. he says, you know, I wouldn't have been who I became without them. You know, they... They put me up for, I was put up for adoption, and I ended up with this family, and um, they, they did amazing things with him. You know, Jobs had, had a quote where he talks about, he says, you have to be crazy enough to, change, to believe you can change the world. Let me find that quote, yeah. actually. And while I'm looking up that quote... Um, the only I, people who change the world are the people who are crazy enough to believe they can change the world. There it is. That's Some, the quote. Yeah. And um, I think that's his... That's his. Uh, that's what. That's where he's operating, and that's that. That mindset, that business mindset. It's it's about changing the world, see, and believing he has the tools to do so. I want to step back from that, though. It doesn't only have to be a business mindset. It doesn't have to be a greed or a power mindset. Mm -hmm. I believe, as a Christian, mm -hmm. that God is calling all of us mm -hmm. to change the world, and I believe mm -hmm. that all of us have the ability to change the world. Through Maybe, creativity? Yes. Yeah, not, I believe that as Some well. not as dramatically as others. Right. But we can shine a light in our neighborhood. Mm -hmm. We can make someone's life better. Mm -hmm. And through doing that, change the world. Right. And that is something that's possible for all of us, mm -hmm. all of the time, as long as we are drawing breath. Mm -hmm. God gives us that ability. I agree. Um, I think... One of the things, let me talk about, let me talk about the next thing, excited about success. I, yeah. I put that down as one of the notes. Um, I think that can be looked at in a toxic way, a narcissistic way, and I think it could be looked at in a positive way. It depends on what you do with that success, right? What comes to mind is your average rapper. Look at your average rapper. They are the, mo the model, literally the model of narcissism, right? It's sort of baked into the, the persona of yeah. a rapper. This is what I do when I have money. Um, I take a brick and I put it up to my head like I'm talking on the phone. Yeah. I showboat. They, they've literally crafted our, oh. our Instagram culture to, 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 to a degree, if you understand. Honestly, from the perspective they, of educated people, they look like losers. They, they really do. They, I mean... Some of them are, I mean, more and more are billionaires now. Oh, yeah. But they could be, you can, you can be a billionaire. And see, this is the thing. Money doesn't mean you have class or you're, you're like, successful at any metric that has usually, uh, I mean, ever mattered. You, you can make lots of money, but, I mean, there's no point in being rich and behaving like that. Right. I think um, with... You know, I think it's more of your low-level rappers yeah. that kind of behave that way, but it's built into the culture, the excitement about success. And the excitement about success with, with, it, with the rappers, it's permeated African-American society. And if you're black, you know what I'm talking about. And if you're not black, you, you know what I'm talking about. You can see it. And as a result, black people are excited, more excited about success. And it drives them. And a lot of black people are becoming millionaires as a result. They're driven by what they see on Instagram. Well, the, you know, and see, the this is what the problem is. Like, black society, unfortunately, orients themselves towards people like Allen Iverson, who is my favorite basketball player, by the way. Some of black society, okay. right? Some. Yeah, some. Not some. all. It's not, not all. all. There's another group that doesn't or get enough attention. Or rappers, rather than the Thomas Sowells, mm -hmm. And the Ben Carsons. And the Oprah Winfrey's. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that's what is really just tragic. Mm -hmm. Because they think that the only way out of this uh, lifestyle is by becoming successful as a rapper or a basketball player or, you know, Instagram famous or something like that. Right. Um, okay, let's, um, let's, that's a whole other discussion. It's a good discussion. We can talk yeah. about that later. Uh, we're... Uh, a few minutes into our second segment on this. We actually didn't plan a second segment, but we're doing it anyway because it's good. Um, I want to talk uh, about the one of the things that I had to go through when I was um, 
developing a bag yep. right for sale. I and I want to talk about the business mindset and my why, why I did it, what drove me. I was watching the news and I used to watch the news all day. And let me tell you how this started because this it wasn't like this before. And this is how I got really active on Facebook annoying all my friends and stuff. Let me tell you how <laughs> let me tell you how this started, guys. I was overseas and I was craving English. I wanted to hear English being spoken outside of a fifth grade level. Yeah. So I got cable TV and I turned and I had CNN International and I loved it. Oh, I left it on all day. CNN International. I watched the business programs, uh, CNN in Africa. And so they had a show called Inside Africa. I watched Christy Lou Stout, who is based in Hong Kong, and all these personalities. Some of them are Australian. It was great. And I got to listen to English. And what happened was, when I got back to the States, my behavior didn't necessarily change. And I was watching the news one day. I was watching some local news. Um, and I saw a story on a guy who couldn't, he was a stay-at-home dad, and he couldn't find uh, changing tables in men's restrooms. And the reasoning is, is because uh, most businesses count on the woman being a stay-at-home mom, mm -hmm. and so they gamble on putting that changing table in the women's restroom. Yep. So anyway, it seeing the despondency in his face, seeing that look in his face, did something to me. And funny enough, it's interesting because it, it, it was the same sort of communication that comes through your TV when you look at a poor kid in some third world country who's got flies all over the face. Give a dollar, a dollar a day. Yeah. And it sparks something in you and then you want to donate, right? So that's what happened to me. And so for me, it wasn't about money. It was about solving the underlying problem. Solving a problem. Uh, yeah. And um, I remember I was reading a book uh, called uh, Reality Check by Robert Kiyosaki. No, um, not Robert Kiyosaki. Guy, Guy Kawasaki. I'm getting my Japanese yeah. names mixed up. Sumimasen to my Japanese population. That means sorry, you guys. Um, so Guy Kawasaki used to work with Steve Jobs back in the Macintosh days. Uh -huh. And Guy Kawasaki, I read this book. It's like a business management book. And I read it while I was overseas. I read a bunch of business books, actually, sales and stuff. And um, he mentioned in the book, if you can solve a problem, you can be rich. Yeah. You got to be able to solve a problem someone has. And I was like, whoa, I actually, you know, I feel sorry for this dad and I want to solve his problem. And of course, who wouldn't want to have some money, right? You can turn it into a business. Nothing wrong with that. Everyone should have the ability to make money. And in fact... It says in the Bible, Scripture, if a man doesn't work, he shall not eat. So it's connected. So work is actually something we should do. Work is something we should be doing. Everyone should be working. <laughs> Going back to our prior conversation, you know, when we're looking at this, one of the problems that we have in the modern world, especially in the United States now, is one of the great motivators mm -hmm. of mankind throughout history mm -hmm. has been Starvation. <laughs> Starvation is a beautiful thing. It's, it's, it's a great mo the great motivator, huh? <laughs> it is a great motivator. There has never been a greater motivator than starvation. The possibility of starvation has pushed people to do work and get up every day. That's true. To put food in their belly. And even if they're strong enough to say, I'm willing to starve myself to death. Mm -hmm. Okay, that requires Buddhist monk-like fortitude. <laughs> okay. Right. I'm not willing to let my loved ones, my child, starve to death. Right. That's even more painful. And what we have done to our great disservice in the modern world is we have given government handouts to people who choose not to do anything. Right. And that's one of the greatest evils. It is. It's evil. Because it, it harms that person and they don't realize it's harming them. It, it puts them in a 
a welfare a welfare state of mind, which is the act the exact opposite of what we're talking about now with the business state. It of creates mind. a victim personality, right, or uh, attitude, and yeah. it's exactly the same as that famous example of Keeps putting a a frog in water and turning up the heat until it finally gets boiled to death. Right. If you take a frog and immediately dump it in boiled water, it's going to try jumping out. You know. Um, all right, let, let me uh, let, let me let me keep going. This is a that's a whole discussion we can have, and we should probably have that in another show. We'll we'll, we'll look into yep. that, but I think that's great. Um, so, one of, let me just back to the prototyping. So, one of the things I did with uh, when I was starting a bag company was I was excited because I had you know when I was a kid I enjoyed art. When I uh, when I first got to high school, um, I uh, I went to high school in um, well. I'm gonna have to get into all that. But when I first got to high school, my ninth grade, I um, I started to invent things. Uh -huh. I took an art class and I started to invent actual products. And I, I don't know if you remember back in the late 80s, maybe 1990, 91. You remember the Reebok pumps that came out? Yep. They had the little pump I on had it? some. You had some? Okay. So I invented, I did the sketches and I invented a, a shoe, a sneaker, that had that could take a little cartridge, uh -huh. but I put HE on it for helium. Not, not that that would make yeah. a difference, but it would go on the back, and you push a button to. Tsh, tsh, that would be kind of cool, right? So what happens? Uh, I don't know. 25, 30 years later, Nike comes out with a shoe. It doesn't Maybe. have. It doesn't have. But you can take the cartridge. Yeah. And put it in kind of like a basketball, the little hole. Yeah. You guys know the little hole in the football, and you pump it up, so you could put it there. But the thing is, you have to have the cartridge in your hand. You have yeah. to have it all with you always. But it would kind of make more sense to have it on the shoe. Yeah. Even if it's a tiny cartridge and you just kind of push a little button. So that was one of the things I, I designed. And my mom and my parents were cool. They were like, oh, this is so exciting. You're designing things. And, you know, if I had followed that path, um, I would have ended up in industrial design, right? Yep. Ugh. Okay. So the next thing I invented was a stove that uh, it was a digital stove, all glass top, um, where you could set timers for each burner. And I was like, if the recipe calls for 20 minutes, why can't I just set the stove for 20 minutes and then it turns off? Uh -huh. The microwave, which we had at that time, could be timed. The oven had a timer. Why don't our stove tops? Seems kind of primitive, right? So I had that. And what's funny was I was actually thinking about this idea a couple months, I'd say about a year or two back, and I was like, you know, how could I improve on this design? And I realized you could take a stove, and the same way you have, let's say, your cell phone, how it has pressure sensors and it knows where you're touching, you could do the same thing with a stove, that way you could stack pots in different places, right? And you could kind of control the temperature. Well, you have four individual timers at least, you know? Right, and you can control, you could probably control that section, maybe there's like a little touch screen, where it's like, okay, this pot right here, it shows you where the pot is on the, on the screen, mm -hmm. this pot, and then you can control the temperature. I was like, that'd be kind of cool to have a stove where you could just kind of move things around and, you know? Yeah. So anyway, I got, it, I got interested in design. So now here I am, I'm, I'm working on a bag that converts into a changing station for, for parents. And I was like, I have to make this thing so it's, I got to make this thing so it's masculine enough to serve these fathers, right? Because most of the diaper changing bags were very feminine. Yeah. Once again, kind of like the businesses that would gamble on, oh, we're going to, um, we're going to gamble on putting the changing station in the women's restrooms, right? This is what designers would do for baby bags. Well, let's make them for women. So you'd end up with things like Mickey Mouse bags and Minnie Mouse and that sort of stuff, right? very feminine theme. So what I decided to do was make a more masculine themed bag. And you know, guys, we like utility, right? We like trucks, we like Jeeps. We like all the little things that hang off of trucks and Jeeps, yep. external tanks. This is what we like, this is what we do. So I invented the bag to be really utilitarian. I'd have pouches that opened and you could put stuff in there and close, but it was hanging off the bag and it looked really cool. And you know, and it was functional. When you're over the baby, it was a station where you could work. Yeah. That's how I designed it. So anyway, why am I talking about this? The excitement of creating, the excitement of doing. Well, the excitement of doing is what drove me, the dream, the goals. That was my 
carrot. Since we brought up, you brought up your invention with the shoes, I said I got the Reebok pumps, right? Mm -hmm. I'll tell you what I had to do in order to get them. Mm -hmm. My mom said, because they were expensive, mm. it was like 1989, 1990. It was like 200 bucks back then. I think it was $108. It was a lot back then. It was then. so expensive. Very and, expensive. And the normal shoes you could buy were probably 50 bucks at the time. Right. Okay, so they were twice as expensive because I don't know who it was who had them, but some famous basketball player had them. Yeah. Okay. I had to read the entire Bible. So my mom said, she said, you have to read the entire Bible, and if you do, I'll get you a pair of Nike pumps. <laughs> or not Nike, Reebok pumps. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Re so Reebok, I, read, yeah. I, I read through the whole Bible. I went and got my size Reebok <laughs> pumps. I've got my windbreakers on, my aqua blue windbreakers, right? I'm walking around the house. But I knew if I walked outside of the house, I would lose the ability to return them. And I was like, Kate, are these a perfect size? I walked mm. around inside the house on the carpet for almost three to five days hmm. and I'd put them away. Testing like, them out. They were, they were all wrapped up, you know, I was basically worshiping my shoe. <laughs> As an idol. <laughs> yeah, it was. You had it up on okay. a shrine. <laughs> but then I realized. Burn some incense. <laughs> I, these shoes cost me a lot of reading time <laughs> and $108. They were valuable. And what I already had been doing was buying bonds, okay? Mm. And I said after a while, you know, if I can delay gratification, mm -hmm. I'm going to take that $108. So I took them, returned them, got my $108, bought bonds with it. Hey. Okay. <laughs> but what I, what I, I bring this up because the thing that often goes with people who are entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. like yourself and like me, is you're able to focus and cut the fat to the point mm -hmm. where you're saying, this is not optimal for me today, mm -hmm. but this decision is going to benefit me more in the future. And one of the characteristics of entrepreneurs and business people oftentimes mm -hmm. is the ability to delay gratification. Right. Um, Ice Cube, famous rapper, actor, he was in the movie Triple um, X. Uh, he, you know, for a rapper, He's merged into a, sort of a business genius now. He's very, very intelligent. Uh -huh. I didn't like him before because he was a gangster. He was a L.A., I don't know what, a crip or whatever. He was a gang, gang banger type. Yeah. Even if he wasn't active in a gang, he's from that community. And I just didn't like those people because I wasn't raised like that. That's a different brand of African-American person who they're outside of my group. And I didn't like the image they portrayed but he's grown up and he's left that and he's somewhat straddling the fence, moving on, kind of like Jay-Z in a way, moving uh -huh. into a business mogul. But he's very intelligent. And what he said was he had to work. He said, if you want to get in the business, you have to be able to work for a good five years to become a millionaire. You got to really work at it. Yeah. And uh, you have to be able to work without pay. And that's what some people can't do because we've become acclimated or acculturated to work two weeks later i get paid well and it, what it is ultimately is a slave mentality because companies mm. will always pay you as long as there's a good deal right they have to be able to make more for your labor than they're paying you exactly. otherwise you will be unemployed exactly or it doesn't work exactly Correct. and and so the, the the issue with that is as a society we've moved away from one where it was a largely agrarian society where we mm -hmm. worked for ourselves mm -hmm. to one where we work for other people. Mm -hmm. We have unlimited wants and relatively few needs, but we confuse needs and wants. Right. And so we're willing to sell our time in order to become actual slaves. Mm -hmm. And then we're unhappy mm -hmm. because we lose control of our time. Right. And a lot of people are trying to buy back their time now. Uh, we're going to wrap up this segment in the next uh, two, three minutes on um, the business mind. I think this has been a great segment. Um, oh. I've learned a lot just sitting here talking to you and just kind no. of revisiting some old. And I'll tell you, one of the things I've helped my cousin some, and a lot of other people with trying to cut through the fat. Mm -hmm. 
identifying needs and wants. Like mm -hmm. if you took everything in the Bible <clears throat> about finances, in my opinion, mm -hmm. and summarize it down, it would basically look like this. He who cannot differentiate between needs and wants will be perpetually f poor. Mm. If you can't differentiate between what you need and what you want, you will always be poor because there's always going to be a new product right. that Steve Jobs or Tim Cook or Elon Musk is going to mm -hmm. sell you. Right. You, yep. And you have to be able to say, I know that would be nice, mm -hmm. but is my time worth it? Because otherwise, right. you're going to have a fixed cost, which will ensure that you are a slave for longer each day. You know, and I, I like how you put that, and I want you to share the thoughts that you shared with me about how your time equals money and how when you look at products, yeah. you look at how much I have to work to get that. Share, can you yeah. share, you, you had an like, example, something about um, shampoo or something, but exactly. maybe, you, maybe you don't tell the, the exact the yeah, full thing. No, yeah. th that is exactly right. Mm -hmm. Whenever I look at something, when I was in um, eighth grade or ninth grade, mm -hmm. I had a teacher named um, Miss King, April King, and she was an, a great teacher. Hi, Miss King. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if she'll ever hear this, but we'll, we'll tag her. <laughs> she was an accountant. Okay, that was what her job actually was, and she was teaching us a class called mm. Essential Living Skills. Okay. Okay, where we would learn how to make teddy bears and our own clothes and all kinds of stuff. Teddy bears, that's essential. I, I, I <laughs> actually really hated the so class. So she's an essential worker, basically, yeah. in COVID, right? It was, you make te we need it was like, I don't know, how to surpri sur survive the next Great Depression. Yeah, we <laughs> need a teddy bear, yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> but anyways, the part of the class I did like uh -huh. was the budgeting, accounting, learning how to write checks and, and, and that kind of thing. And mm. one of the terms that I was first introduced to as a ninth grader mm -hmm. was a term called amortization. Okay. And what she said is, you take whatever item it is, say jeans, then you divide it by the number of times you're gonna wear it, and mm -hmm. that becomes a cost per wear, Jesus. the cost per use. Mm -hmm. And that was a profound, concept for me. Mm -hmm. Everything I look at, whether it's a vehicle, last vehicle I drove, 333,000 miles. Um, and it's because I look and say, how efficient can I make this? Exactly. If I buy this item of clothing, I have to trade time for it. Mm -hmm. And if I wear it more, mm -hmm. it's going to cost me less. Mm -hmm. And it's the same with your home, your car, your clothes. When whatever you're doing, is that the greatest argument for buying quality products? Uh, for me, it is. Okay. I, I mean, I, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll spend sometimes a lot on shoes, mm -hmm. but then I'll resell them. There's shoes I've resold three different times, <laughs> and I'm cheap enough. Mm -hmm. You could say cheap, you could say frugal, whatever you want to say. Smart. When I'm overseas, mm -hmm. I'll take those shoes and I'll have some person in um, Bahrain or mm -hmm. India or somewhere else, mm -hmm. lower cost labor, resell my shoes. Yeah, nothing wrong with that. Nope. And absolutely, it's nothing wrong with that. It's like putting new tires on. Yeah. Nothing wrong, yeah. And for me, I totally suggest that all of you look at things in a cost per use. 